Okay. So why don't we go and get started? Jeremy, if you could share your screen and get started when you're ready. And and people make sure to raise your hand if you have questions. Okay. That sounds good. Thanks, Adam. Um, so just some context on what this talk is going to be. As Adam said, this is work that has been done through Exatrix, which is a collaboration focused on applying graph neural networks uh, for physics, specifically for particle physics. Uh, I'm going to talk about some work to look into developing these kinds of techniques, specifically in the Dune experiment. Um, so I'll start by introducing some relevant concepts, like explain what Dune is and what a graph neural network is. Um, and then I'm going to run through some early things we tried that uh, didn't work particularly well, um, some things we tested that didn't pan out. Um, and then I'll talk about the things we're working on now, which are starting to show a bit more promise and uh, are starting to work pretty well. Um, so we talk about neutrino physics and machine learning. Um, one trend in neutrino physics specifically, uh, although I think also in, in high energy physics more broadly over the last few years, is increasing use of machine learning techniques for reconstruction. Um, they have a, a lot of power, um, particularly for uh, neutrino experiments where often the kind of data you're trying to classify or reconstruct uh, lends itself quite naturally to um, inputs to machine learning. So an example here is um, the pixel map on the top right you can see is from the NOVA experiment. So NOVA uses a convolutional neural network called CVN um, as its primary method for selecting neutrino interactions. Uh, so you can see here a pixel map uh, with, uh, this is a new mu interaction with a long muon track and some hadronic activity. Um, and because of the, the way the detector is constructed, you can just feed that almost straight into a CNN to classify the, the interaction type. Um, and uh, these kinds of techniques are being used all across neutrino physics. So microboon, which is a, a short baseline uh, experiment at Fermilab, is also developing a lot of techniques. Um, and also a lot of people are developing things for Dune, which I'll, I'll explain what Dune is in a minute. Um, the thing I want to highlight here is a lot of these techniques, these CNN techniques, um, take this data, which is what we call uh, locally dense but globally sparse. So if you take a look at this pixel map in the top right and imagine that you're building a tensor from that, um, most of the elements in that tensor are just going to be zero. The actual interesting information is limited to a very small region in this image. And so applying kind of raw standard CNN techniques, it's actually very computationally inefficient. Um, the other downside to using CNNs is that if your data that comes out of your detector isn't structured on a regular grid, then you need to perform some kind of transformation in order to, to get a, a kind of representation. So the example here is space points in 3D that you reconstruct in the Codagon TPC aren't naturally on a grid. Um, so you need to voxelize them in order to get something that will work. Um, and there are techniques that do that and those show promise. But um, one of the, the reasons using a GNN is attractive is because you can work with your data in whatever structure it has naturally. Um, you don't have to perform any kind of transformations. Um, and also GNNs like sparse CNNs are a naturally sparse approach, right? The size of your input is determined by the amount of activity in your detector rather than the size of the detector itself. Um, let me talk a little bit about liquid argon time projection chambers. This is a detector technology that is seeing very heavy use uh, particularly at the Fermilab um, neutrino program currently. So we have these three uh, detectors, which collectively are called the short baseline neutrino program, Microboon, Icarus, and SBND, um, that are running or, or being constructed currently, uh, all of which utilize this technology. Uh, and also in the future, there's going to be uh, Dune, the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, which is going to be a very large um, set of liquid argon TPCs, very deep underground. Um, the basic principle behind this detector technology is you have this um, cryogenically cooled cryostat of liquid argon. Um, uh, as a charged particle propagates through that liquid argon, it's going to uh, leave a, a trail of ionization electrons behind. Um, and because you have a cathode plane on one side of the cryostat with a, a large high voltage uh, on it, and on the opposite side, you have this collection of anode plane wires uh, you induce this large electric field, which causes the ionization electrons to drift towards the wires. Um, these electrons are going to induce a signal on the first two sets of wires before being collected on the last uh, set of wires. Um, and so you, that effectively gives you 
three 2D representations of what your 3D uh, interaction looked like that you can then reconstruct back into a 3D representation. Um, and because your timing resolution on your wires is very good, um, and because the spacing of your wires is very small, you end up with very high resolution images, uh, a lot of information on what's going on in your detector. Like I said, Dune is going to be very large. Uh, it's going to be 70,000 tons of liquid argon, very deep underground at the Samford Research Facility um, in, uh, in South Dakota. Uh, we're going to fire a, a beam of neutrinos from here at Fermilab to SURF, um, measure the neutrinos on both ends, and understand how the neutrinos have changed as they propagate. Um, and that gives us some insight into some uh, parameters from phenomenology that we don't currently understand. Um, because it's so deep underground, you're effectively in a background-free environment outside of very rare processes like atmospheric neutrinos, which themselves can be signal. Um, but the, the basic design of the detector is you have these four very large modules um, that you can see in this schematic in the top right. You can see two of them in red. Um, each one of those modules is going to consist of 200 individual TPCs, so these, these smaller cryostats stacked next to each other and on top of each other. Um, and in order to get a representation of what's happening uh, in your detector at large, you need to transform the, uh, the images you get out from each individual TPC and kind of stitch them together to give you a much larger representation. Um, very quickly to, to talk about what kind of low-level reconstruction is done. Um, on your induction planes, the first two wire planes, because the electrons are drifting past them um, rather than being collected, you get this bi bipolar peak. Um, and so you need to perform deconvolution on the wires um, to get a nice Gaussian uh, shape in your, in your wire head that you can then fit Gaussian hits to. Um, and that's kind of the low level reconstruction you do just to deconvolve and then hit find your wires. Um, and then once you have those, those hits, you have these three 2D images um, angled at 30, minus 36, zero and 36 degrees. Um, and you can Basically, that gives you enough information to mostly resolve the genesis and work backwards from those three 2D representations to a 3D representation. Let me quickly change pace and talk about graph networks. Um, so the basic principle behind a graph neural network is that instead of uh, representing your data as a just a, a tensor, um, an image on a regular grid, you can describe it as a graph, you know, essentially just a series of nodes and edges. So you have these quantized objects uh, with some arbitrary set of features, which are your nodes. And then you also make some kind of statement on what the relationship between those nodes is, and that forms your edges. So in the context that I'm gonna be talking about today, the nodes are either 3D space points in the detector or 2D hits. Um, and you, you form potential edges uh, where you think there might be a relationship between the hits or the space points, um, and then Often you're classifying the edges to decide whether or not the connection that you've proposed is actually real. Um, but there are a number of things you can do with this kind of data structure, right? You can classify the nodes if you want to, or you can classify the edges. Um, you can classify the full graph as a whole. You know, that's, that's similar to the difference between segmentation and image classification in a CNN. Um, and you could also think about doing other things like regression that I, I won't talk about today. Um, let me zoom in a little bit and talk about Heptrix. I think both of the talks today are Exitrix, which is kind of the successor to Heptrix. Um, Heptrix uh, developed a lot of these techniques uh, in the context of the LHC, taking these kind of message passing neural networks um, and applying them in the LHC world to see how good a job they can do at particle tracking. Um, Exitrix builds on that. Um, and is taking some of those concepts further. Um, but you can see in the lower left here, this is an example of you know, when you have these interactions that come out radially from a, a, a central, you know, your, your detector is in layers coming out from where you know the interaction is happening. You have hits on your sequential detector layers. You want to try and draw lines between the hits and reconstruct those into tracks. Um, and so in the, in the bottom left, you can see an example of doing this with edge classification, right, where the network has looked at all of the potential um, potential edges between uh, the detector layers and has just drawn in in black the ones it thinks are real. And you can see it's able to pick out these 
um, particle tracks really nicely. Um, and the same goes in the lower right, where instead of doing edge classification, you're doing node classification for a specific track. And it's picking out in red the nodes it thinks are associated with a particular track. And you can do it either way, and uh, it essentially gives you the same answer either way. Um, you can identify a, a particle track coming out from the central detector. Um, so the work we've been working on specifically is seeing if we can take these kinds of concepts um, and apply them in Dune uh, for the kind of reconstruction problems that we deal with there. Um, so I'm, like I said, going to first talk about some things that didn't work and then move on to some things that did. Um, in general, for the studies I'm going to talk about today, we used two sets of simulation. Um, the first were atmospheric neutrino interactions. So these are very high energy events, typically up to the tens of GeV. Um, the, the neutrinos are coming in from a very broad angular distribution because they're atmospheric, they can be produced really from any direction. Um, and also they're very high occupancy events. You know, it's, it's common to get these kind of deep and elastic scatters where you have a lot of hadronic activity in the final state. Um, and so this is the, the sample we started with. And I think maybe we were a little optimistic here and starting with something that's very big and messy and complicated and kind of setting ourselves up to fail. Um, so when, when we weren't able to get anything that worked well out of the box with these really complicated events, we took a step back, um, generated a sample of charged current quasi-elastic beam neutrino interactions. So these are lower in energy. Um, the neutrinos are all coming from a, a specific direction, right? They're coming along the beam line. Um, you get pretty clean interactions, um, right? If it's a muon neutrino, you tend to get a long muon track and um, some hadronic activity, like perhaps a proton out. Um, and they're a lot less messy and a lot easier to interpret. So this example on the on the kind of cartoon on the right of the slide is the example of the incoming UE, um, where the electron neutrino interacts in your argon volume um, with a nucleus, and you effectively just get out a proton track and an electron shower. Um, so those are the two samples we looked at. I'll, I'll talk first at the, talk, I'll talk first about the atmospheric neutrino interactions. Um, so the very first thing we tried to do was some kind of clustering technique um, where, uh, where we would cluster these reconstructed space points in 3D. You draw these kind of potential connections between the 3D space points. So you can see here the space points are in blue, the potential edges we draw are in pink. Um, and the idea behind this was that we could define some kind of ground truth where we can make a decision, you know, we can look at the truth information to tell whether two space points came from the same true particle, define that as our ground truth, um, and, uh, and try and train a network to figure out whether each space point came from the same particle as its neighbors and, and come up with some kind of clustering scheme that way. Um, the way we did this was with a message passing network. So this is the same network that was developed for the Heptrix applications I showed a couple of slides ago. Um, effectively, the way that this work is, works is you alternate between a, a network that uh, operates on the graph edges and a network that operates on the graph nodes. And you kind of bounce back and forth between the two of them. Um, and with every iteration of this network, you do what's called message passing, right? As you, as you iterate over um, the, the subsequent iterations of this model, you're allowing information to travel further and further. Um, so I, I can show a little cartoon of exactly what this means, right? If you imagine that you start with your graph, um, in this case, let's imagine it's, it's the hits in your detector. So each one of the nodes is a hit in your detector. And you, you know some features of each hit coming in. You know, for instance, where in the detector this hit uh, occurred, you know the amplitude of the hit, right, in terms of if, if you fit a Gauss in, you have an amplitude and an RMS that you can fit there. So we have these nodes and we have some features coming in. Um, what we can then do is switch to looking at the edges and say, okay, let's form features on the edges by pulling in the features from the two nodes that are attached to this. So I can take the, for, for one of these edges on the left, I don't think you can see my mouse here, but for one of these edges on the left, right, you can pull in the features from the incoming node and the outgoing node and concatenate those together. And those collectively can form uh, features on the edge. Now that I have a tensor of features for each edge, I can feed that into a, a simple neural network, really just like a, uh, um, a linear layer followed by activation and, and softmax. Um, and I can use that, that convolution layer to form these new edge scores. Um, what I can then do is reduce that down to either, in the uh, Heptrix's case, it was a single score that was effectively a, an attention score. Um, I'll later talk about a, a 
variant of this network where instead of a single score, we collapse down to a set of scores uh, for different classes. Um, but, uh, but effectively, you can come up with a, a probability for each edge based on the, the features that you fed into it. Um, and so because you have this probability score or set of probability scores for each edge, you can then use that score to uh, message pass um, between the nodes. So this is the node side of the network, where this is the edge side of the network. This is the node side, where you can propagate each node's features to the ones it's connected to, uh, but wait the, the features you're passing by the score you, you placed on the edge. And this is what's, what the attention mechanism is, right? It's if you have a, a low uh, probability score on an edge, your network has decided that's not an important edge. And so you basically prune that, that um, avenue for message passing out. And you can naturally weight up the edges you think are important for message passing and allow information to flow through those. But now you've formed new features on your edges. Um, and you can, you can, again, do a convolution on this side to linear layers, activations, and so on, um, to form a set of new uh, node features. And now you're back where you're started, where you have features on each node. And you can go back to the start of this process, form new edge features, and do this over and over again. And the reason this is called a message passing network, right, is because when you repeat this process, your information spreads across the graph. So if you imagine the features of this one node I've highlighted in yellow, um, after one full pass through this network architecture, information from that uh, node has been passed across those edges to the ones it's connected to. So after iteration one, that information has spread. If I now iterate the network again, that information has passed through um, to those neighboring nodes again. You can imagine for a larger graph, as you go through more and more, inf more and more uh, iterations, information can travel further and further. And you can start to use the context of the graph as a whole to, to classify local regions within it. Um, so that's effectively how this kind of uh, model works. Um, another thing we tried besides this clustering approach, which didn't pan out, was space point reconstruction. Uh, the idea is that when you move from 2D to 3D, um, that's often a noisy process. And we have some optimization methods for removing those ghosts, but they aren't perfect. So the idea was whether we could train a, a graph network to do that job better. Um, so both of these um, event displays on this slide show some ground truths we provided to do that. You can see in the lower left, there's a, uh, a muon track where the, the yellow, essentially, the color scale here is a probability um, talking about uh, how close the space point is to the true trajectory of the particle. The idea being that you could train a network to learn to only keep the space points that are highlighted in yellow and throw away the spurious ones in blue. Um, the same goes in the lower right. This is a very complicated atmospheric interaction again, where we would highlight space points that well represented the event in terms of their proximity to the true particles um, in green and everything else is in red. Um, we construct these using the, the potential graph edges, just using a simple k-nearest neighbor. Um, and we attempted to use the uh, message passing network I just uh, talked about for this. Also, I, I explored another model I don't have time to go into detail on called PointNet++, uh, which is specifically designed to operate on point clouds. So it's perfect for this kind of application. Um, it uses this technique called set abstraction. Um, and uh, and it effectively works kind of like a unit, if you know how a unit works, in that it picks representative space points to um, describe a local region and then zooms out and out, forming uh, kind of lower and lower resolution representations of the graph um, that uh, describe higher and higher level features um, in terms of uh, in terms of kind of spatial extent. Um, this ended up pa not panning out, just not because it, it didn't work, but just because the PyTorch implementation at the time we did this work was uh, not particularly well optimized, particularly for the techniques you use to aggregate space points in a local radius. Um, I think that was just a deficiency, and we, we use a tool called PyTorch Geometric to do this. Um, and some of the geometric tools we were using were just not well GPU optimized, so this ended up not being viable. Um, uh, for the message passing network we used, we effectively found that these 3D approaches just didn't work very well. You only marginally learn above the noise level. This is some example of some training metrics where you can see the, the true and false edge accuracy is essentially the inverse of each other, um, meaning that it wasn't learning particularly well. Um, so after we tested some of these 3D approaches and they didn't work particularly well, we took a step back. We decided to try something that was a little closer conceptually to what 
um, Haptrix had done in terms of uh, drawing tracks in 2D. Um, so you can leverage the structure of the detector in the LHC to sparsify the number of edges, reduce the graph size, right? If I jump all the way back to these um, Haptrix plots, you can see the fact that they have this layered detector gives you a natural constraint on the number of edges because you can only draw potential edges between a point on one layer and, and the hits um, in the subsequent layer and the previous layer. And that naturally reduces the number of potential edges. Whereas for um, this kind of application, uh, we don't have that kind of constraint. So it's a lot more difficult to, to place those kind of constraints, particularly when you're in three dimensions. So moving down to two dimensions means that we can be uh, a little more smart in how we draw our potential edges. Um, so in terms of the 2D approaches, like I said, the, the representation in Dune and in liquid on TPCs generally is three views with different wire pitches. Um, we could uh, effectively color code um, these interactions according to the true simulated particle. Um, these are two, three 2D representations of the same 3D interaction. And you can see here, this is a new, in, new e interaction with an electromagnetic shower uh, and a proton coming out from the vertex. Um, this is the same, again, this is a, a new mu graph. Um, you, can, you can come up with your potential edges just by connecting hits that are adjacent in wire and time. Um, I've drawn gray potential edges on this, on this event display, but they're very hard to see just because you can see that the, um, you get a natural constraint just from the sparsity of the graph in general. Like a lot of the edges you would see are actually hidden behind the nodes. Um, because they are really only working for the, the tracks that you can see. Um, in terms of the new graph, the way we uh, approached this problem was not just to classify true or false edges um, as Heptrix had done, um, but try to classify them with uh, a set of flavored scores. Um, so we draw these potential edges for hits within five wires and 50 time ticks of each other. Um, and, uh, and classify them in truth as hadronic, muonic, uh, EM shower, or false. Um, and that's the objective we give to network for learning. Um, the edges are false if the, the two hits weren't produced by the same underlying particle in the simulation. But if they were, we then, uh, we then flavor whether that particle was uh, a muon or descended from the primary muon in a new interaction. Um, if it's a shower edge, that means it is uh, part of the EM shower instigated by the primary electron in a new E interaction. Um, and everything that doesn't fall into one of those three categories ends up being put into the hadronic category. Um, the reason for that is for these simple CCQE events, you effectively just have these really simple topologies where you have the, the muon track or the shower um, and typically just a, a proton um, or a couple of protons coming out of the vertex um, most of the time. And so you can, you can kind of, uh, come up with this very simple definition for the hadronic case where it's kind of a catch-all class for everything that didn't fall into one of the others. Um, and again, I can show something similar. This is what uh, uh, an example graph would look like for the new E interaction. So I can jump between, you can see the, the muon track is green here, whereas the hadronic, the proton track is blue. Um, and here the story is similar, except now the, the shower itself is, is red rather than green. Um, and, uh, here, the, the model that we built is a, a little more complicated than the one I showed earlier in that we, we have what's called a multi-head attention message passing network where you um, pass messages and form node features independently for each class in the network. Um, so rather than taking a single binary attention score, you have a separate attention score, for each one of the classes, um, and you can take the softmax um, of the scores on each edge with each iteration. The idea here is that if the network thinks a particular edge is uh, very shower like, for instance, then that will naturally weight down message passing to the other classes. Um, and hopefully that will help the network to uh, disambiguate between the different class types. Um, and so the kind of current state we're at now with this model. Um, it's doing fairly well. It's achieving around 84% accuracy um, in classifying the graph edges. You can see a confusion matrix here where we, uh, we see actually really good accuracy for showers currently around 90%. Um, but there's still some room for improvement in the tracks. I think particularly the, the model sometimes struggles to tell the difference between um, 
muon tracks and hadronic tracks. And we're thinking about explicitly teaching the model um, the concept of DDX to help it learn that. So here's an example of an event where in the ground truth, you have this long muon track and, and the shorter uh, proton track, but the model has actually flipped the two tracks um, and gotten them wrong. Um, you can also see for showers, there are some cases where the, the model will um, pick out kind of smaller little edges within the shower and, and classify them as being track-like. So there are still a couple of things that we need to um, drill down on and, and iron out, but this is, this is definitely the most promising results we've had so far. Um, I'm running low on time, so let me very quickly talk about some things we're working on now. Um, currently, when we do these categorizations, you can see the um, we're, we're basically feeding in each view completely independently. Um, we're not giving the model any um, way to leverage information from the multiple views. Um, you know, it can't take context from one view and, and use that to help it figure out what's going on in another view. And one thing we're thinking about is if you could also message pass across hits that occurred concurrently in time across multiple planes, it's possible that may help the, the network to figure out what's going on within each plane. Um, and kind of a, a longer term goal here is to, to maybe even combine with more heterogeneous graph node types. So in liquid and DPC, you also have an optical system that you can use for time tagging. And if you could combine the nodes in each of the three views with nodes um, in a time system as well, that may give you some extra uh, resolving power. Um, and more broadly, um, I think edge classification, like I've said a couple of times, is a really natural fit for track forming in the high limit of CLHC. But um, I think it, it clearly works well um, also in, in neutrino physics, but I think it's perhaps a little less naturally suited to the problem of kind of clustering these hits into dense objects rather than drawing lines. Um, so some things we're working on now are a scheme to take the, the edge classification that we have and collapse that down into a kind of a definition of the objects. Um, and also it would be nice to, in terms of our loss function, have an objective that scores each edge in, independently, or rather to say the current objective function scores each edge independently. Um, it doesn't have any way to figure out um, what classifying an edge means in the context of how that you then group those nodes together. And so to have a, a loss function that could do that explicitly um, might help you to, to learn. Um, and we can think about newer techniques like graph pooling um, as a way of, of uh, clustering the graph, I think is interesting. And also things like instant segmentation, whether there are any concepts we can take from that in the CIM world and apply it here too. Um, and then also just to move beyond these more simple topologies and try and uh, work on more complex topologies as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the state of, of this work at present. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any questions for Jeremy? Yeah, maybe I, I can ask a question. Sure. So uh, on this, maybe it was page 27, you showed us this uh, um, electron, uh, yeah. So why does it happen? I mean, do you understand why, why it happens that parts of the shower are assigned to be, I guess, hadronic? Yeah, I think that, at the center of the shower, you have these edges that are so densely connected that it's very easy for the network to figure out, you know, just because of the density of nodes at that point, it's very easy for the model to figure out that these are part of a shower. But when you get out to the edges of the shower, you can see like out in the, the, at the top and bottom, I think that because information only passes so far in this model, so this, this message passing network is set to pass four, um, it has four iterations of message passing. There's only so far information can travel. I think when you're out at the edges, it's a little harder sometimes for the model to figure out that this is a, not a track segment, but part of a dense shower. Um, and, and that ties into the fact that when you are calculating the loss, you know, you're calculating the loss independently, completely independently for each edge, right? You're just looking at, okay, the, 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 the ground truth for this edge was this class, but the model has scored it as this other class. And the, the model currently has no way to take those edges at the edge uh, in the context of the object that it's connected to um, in a way that if you had this kind of more instance-based loss function, you might be able to um, fix those kinds of mistakes. Um, so I think this is a consequence of the way we're doing things now. Um, and also, I think there are, there are ways we can fix it. We just haven't got there yet. 
Yeah, thanks. Maybe to follow up on that, do you have any thoughts about how to add in sort of instance level loss information? So I have, yeah, there are a few ideas um, that I'm, there's some ideas that I have come up with specifically within the GNN world. I think the other thing I still need to do is also um, do more research into how instant segmentation is done in the CNN world, to see if there are any ideas that we can appropriate from there. I, I can say in the graph world, um, there are some uh, graph pooling. Uh, so I mentioned graph pooling here on this slide very quickly. I can expand on that a little bit. Um, so a lot of the time when when these these graph pooling layers, which effectively, you know, the, the idea behind the graph pooling layer, it's similar to pooling in a CNN, except you're taking your graph and trying to reduce it down. You're trying to say, okay, I have a graph with this many nodes in. I want to remove some nodes and end up with a smaller graph that I think is kind of a lower resolution representation um, of the, the original graph and somehow aggregate information from the, the nodes that I'm dropping into the nodes that I'm keeping. Um, and often when people come up with these kinds of layers, it's kind of an intermediate task for um, getting to a final single score for the graph. So you don't actually really care about the transformations you're performing on the graph. You, know, you don't care about which nodes you're taking away and which you're keeping, because eventually you're just going to pull everything down to a single number anyway. But I think some of those, uh, another thing you could do with those pooling layers is saying, well, if the, if the, if the pooling layer is giving me a reduced graph, um, could I construct my ground truth as a reduced graph um, that represents a clustered version of the original graph and come up with a way to write a loss function um, that compares the, a pooled graph coming out of my model with my true pooled graph. Um, and if I can define that in the, as an objective function, I can make pooling the graph the objective of the network. Um, and so there's a specific graph pooling layer called ASAP. Um, I think it stands for adaptive structure aware pooling. Um, but the way it works effectively is you, you learn what's called a, a cluster assignment matrix, which is essentially just a matrix n by n, where n is the number of um, nodes in your graph. And it's just a, a, a matrix, essentially a correlation matrix, where you are uh, assigning the off diagonals to one if the two hits came from the same object and zero otherwise. Um, and if you can construct a cluster assignment matrix in your, your ground truth, um, that describes how these objects can be clustered together. You could train a model, you know, ASAP already produces this cluster assignment matrix um, as part of how it operates. And so you could imagine using something like a Levenstein edit distance where you're just comparing the difference between the two matrices um, as, a, as a graph loss. Um, and you're trying to, to learn this representation and that's, that's the objective of your network. Um, I know it's, it's still kind of a, a half formed idea because the question there is how you form, how in the model output you form a cluster assignment matrix that is continuous such that you get smooth gradients when you try to train. And that's not something that I've figured out yet, but those are the kind of ideas I'm thinking about. Okay. I see a hand from Aaron. Yes. Uh, Jeremy, can you remind me uh, how far we are with this method in comparison with the regular CNN? When you look at the pixels and you do pixel classification, uh, because that one is performed way better, right? In terms of shower versus uh, non shower hits, or something like that. Yeah, so I mean, it depends on. At least for I... this kind of topologies, like shower versus uh, hadronic or muon. Right. Yeah, I, I guess I can say I don't think this is. This is definitely a harder problem to solve than CNNs. I think that you could definitely do better out of the box with a CNN um, than with this method. The, the reason we're exploring this is just because I think it is a method that is suits our data a little better. Um, I guess I can say in terms of efficiencies, I think the, the state of the art right now is the work the Slack group is doing where they report kind of up you know, effectively perfect efficiencies at reconstructing things. It's not clear to me whether, I know early on their studies were not full simulation and reconstruction, but they were using inputs that effectively do the JN4 simulation and then use the true energy deposits as a, uh, as kind of an, an analog. Um, 
that they train their network on. So it's not clear to me whether they still get really good efficiencies when you go through the full reconstruction chain or not. I just don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I think in general, I can say, I think CNNs out of the box would do better than these methods. The, the, the purpose of this work is to try and develop something that um, works as well. Um, you know, CNNs are such a kind of powerhouse general purpose tool that a lot of people have worked on for a very long time. Um, and the question we're asking here is, is there a more specialized tool that we could use for our data that um, works better? But, but obviously you have to do a lot of work up front to try and figure out exactly what that looks like. Thanks. Okay, we have another hand raised. So, uh, hello. Uh, so uh, I had a quick question. So uh, is there any extension of the graph signal on 3D here because, uh, so 3D is still is a future work, right? You are only representing the results on based on the 2D representation of the signal on graphs, right? Yes, for these, this is just 2D at this point. Yeah, because, because I was thinking if you represent a tensor on graph is still on research stage and how the CNN is defined on that, it's not properly described mathematically. Hmm. Yeah, so another question, if you please go to slide number six. Of course. Yes, so uh, here the structure of the graph, how do you define the structure of the graph? So is it a probabilistic graphical model or you learn is from the nearest neighbors by you said relationship between nodes. Is it based on their distances or based on the signal qualities? Yes, it's based. So right now, the way we draw nodes is pretty simplistic. I actually have this on one of my slides. Um, it's just a simple square threshold around each each node. We have this, you know, you we have a wire in one dimension and, and time in the other. So we just basically draw this box, which is five wires and a margin of five wires and fifty time ticks around each hit, um, and any other nodes within in that proximity, uh, uh, we draw a potential edge. So it's very simplistic right now. We're, we're looking at, well, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I tried some other techniques for drawing uh, graph edges. I tried, one of the things I tried was Delaunay triangulation, which did not work well at all. Um, I think we're, we're currently thinking about things like KD trees, where we would also, we'd have a, like a, a more complicated multi-dimensional threshold where you can also take into account things like the hit amplitude, um, when you draw those potential edges. But for now, it's this pretty simple threshold. Simple thresholding and some sort of heuristic approach and you just look at the close proximity, right? That's right. Yeah, okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so we have two more hands raised. Why don't we answer these, but then we need to move on to Savannah's talk. So Shangyang first and then Chris. Thanks, thanks for the, this very nice talk. I have a question on the page 27 about these uh, confusion metrics. I'm just wondering from your uh, expertise on the, uh, um, on the detector part of why, um, do you know like why the muons and the hydronics are more difficult to reconstruct for the GNN? Because I see that you have like 11% of them are reconstructed as, as a force. However, right. the showering seems that the GNN does a better job. I'm just wondering like a, from physical point of view, what makes the muon and hydronic more difficult than the showers? So actually, I think this may not be a physics answer. I think this is a practical answer, um, which is that we have a very, in terms of the, the number of edges of each class, we have a very unbalanced training set. Because these EM showers are really dense, you end up with a lot of shower edges compared to the track-like edges. And actually the, the false edges tend to be, you know, right at the very vertex where the two, where the, where the shower and the, and the track meet is kind of mostly the only place you even get any false edges. And so that means we have a, a training set which is, is very strongly biased towards having a lot of shower edges in. Um, we have fewer muon and hadronic edges and, uh, and false, we have almost none. Um, and so the, the weighting scheme we apply for the loss function is just a simple inverse of, of how often each class appears. Um, but, but actually one of the things we're testing right now is um, it seems like that isn't quite enough. It isn't quite enough just to, to weight up um, inverse to the, the kind of populations of each class because it seems like the, the shower 
class is still the one that learns best. So we're, we're looking into actually overcorrecting and the way we weight the loss function to weight up the, the worst performing classes by more than um, it takes to get them just back up to, to equal, um, to see if that changes um, which classes the network does well in. Great, thanks. Okay. Now, Chris, and then we'll have to move on yeah. to uh, soon as well. right. So I'm gonna let Alex ask this since it's the same question. Okay. Um, what was the issue that you were having with uh, Delaunay triangulated graphs? Why is it those weren't working? The network just wasn't uh, learning well. Um, I think the, I don't know. I never actually, I guess I can say I, we actually tried it this way and I tried switching to Delaunay to see if things would improve and they got much worse. And I didn't uh, do a lot of work to understand why. I guess my hypothesis is that when we draw the edges this way, um, you're restricting information, how, how far information can pass in a way that helps the network to learn. Um, my kind of hypothesis was when you Delaunay triangulate your edges, um, you suddenly allow information to travel really large distances just with a single iteration of message passing in a way that potentially could um, wash out information really quickly. That was that was kind of the, the explanation I came up with, but I have to admit I didn't um, do a lot of work to really dig in and back up that assumption with, with evidence. So um, thank you very much for this talk. Um, and now we're going to move on to uh, Savannah's talk. Um, great, thanks. I'll just share my screen. Great. Uh, does it look okay? Yes, that looks great. Very good. Okay. Um, great. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about some um, different ways we've used GNNs for reconstruction, specifically at the LHC. Um, so maybe some of my intro slides are pretty, uh, are, are kind of like repeats of, of some stuff Jeremy talked about. Um, so I'll go through them quickly, um, but just, um, to, to kind of frame the problem, um, LHC data is, is measured by dedicated subsystems um, in our detector that basically try to quantify interactions um, with these highly granular of particles with these highly granular systems. Um, so we get these really granular readouts that then have to be reconstructed into particle components. So things like tracks or clusters and then full particle candidates um, that we eventually um, used for the physics analysis, like uh, precision measurements and, and new physics searches. Um, so a challenge we run into is that this data is often sparse. Um, we are not, you're not lighting up the whole detector um, with every collision. Um, and it's also not fixed size. You can have a different number of particles and therefore a different number of all these components um, in different events. So traditionally we've stored this in a tree structure um, where you can traverse like the levels of the trees. And so it allows for var variable sized information and um, a hierarchical structure. Um, but for a lot of ML applications we've um, looked at initially, um, it, we, it, we kind of use zero padding or other ways of sort of forcing this data into a matrix representation, whether that's for a standard um, neural network or um, an image, a calorimeter image or something like that for convolutional neural networks. Um, so the, you know, I guess interesting advantage of graphs um, is that they're this mathematical structure um, of nodes and edges where it doesn't have to be fixed size and it's inherently geometric. So it can represent different kinds of relational or geometric data. Um, and it can also be really multi-level where the nodes themselves can be like encoded graphs or, or sets of um, 
different different uh, levels of physics information. So they can be, you know, individual detector readouts for things like clustering. They can be um, clusters themselves, track hits, um, particle information. Um, you can really explore like a hierarchy of data with the same kind of geometric structure. Um, so. Yeah, I think Jeremy covered this, um, but graph neural networks, kind of the standard um, graph convolutional network architecture that we've been using for a lot of these applications so far, try to learn a smart embedding of the graph structure um, where it's easier to do some kind of classification or regression task. Um, and they do this by leveraging geometric information um, by passing and aggregating messages from the neighbors. Um, and they do this using typically shallow um, feed forward neural networks that are aggregating information from um, different parts of the graph and updating the embedding of the nodes and edges. So I'm gonna go quickly through a couple of recent examples of, of different ways we've used um, GNNs in LHC reconstruction, and then I'll focus on um, doing tracking with GNNs, which is what I personally work on. Um, so this is not, yeah, not all my work. Um, so I encourage you to check out the full um, talks that I've linked here um, for more information on these products or projects. Um, so the first thing I am going to talk about is um, using GNNs for jet tagging. Um, so this is a particle net. Uh, graph convolutional architecture, which is um, the, the same kind of architecture I explained on the previous slide. And in this setup, each node is a reconstructed particle um, or secondary vertex in the event. So it's quite high level information. Um, and they form the edges just with a standard K uh, nearest neighbors algorithm to create this graph. Um, and then you can do message passing across the graph between these um, between these particle and uh, vertex candidates um, to identify, uh, to basically classify the full graph. So you're doing um, jet flavor tagging um, with this message passing architecture. Um, and so you can see in this kind of bottom diagram, you have an event with a bunch of different jets. Each jet is a graph, which is a collection of particles. You run your standard uh, graph convolutional network over the graph for however many iterations to aggregate information. And then you use that aggregated information to do the jet flavor tagging. And from the initial results in CMS, it actually outperforms slightly um, the current um, deep AK8 uh, jet tagging methods, which is quite exciting. Um, there's also been some cool work on using GNNs for particle reconstruction. Um, so uh, working with um, to, to form particle flow candidates, um, which are basically um, one level of the like data hierarchy that I explained at the beginning. So these are um, the way we represent um, things like electrons or um, quarks, different kinds of things, um, like the full particle, how they've moved throughout the detector. So in this setup, um, each node is a particle flow element, which is one of these um, subcomponents of a particle, so like a track, a calorimeter cluster, um, or, or things like that. And the edges are formed um, through a dynamic process. They've looked at both k-nearest neighbors and radius graph methods. Um, and there's several different architectures that they've looked at. So one is um, using this encoding and decoding um, deep neural network with then a standard graph convolutional network um, to um, basically embed the graph and then do the message passing um, for particle classification and momentum regression. Um, they also can use a radius um, graph method um, without the uh, encoding and decoding um, to do the same kind of classification and um, and momentum regression. Um, and they don't have comparisons to existing algorithms yet, um, but you, the training does converge. Um, so this is an ongoing study. Um, and then another thing I found really interesting 
recently is work on um, doing uh, simulation and generation with um, graphs. So this is an extension of your standard generative adversarial network um, where you, you, you have a generator um, trying to simulate data or create, create new data um, that's trained concurrently with a discriminator that tries to distinguish your um, generated data from actual data. Um, so in this um, GNN GAN, the generator um, uses message passing on a, a kind of random noise graph to recreate a set of input features that you give it. So it starts with a kind of random graph and you give it the event or you give it the um, jet, eta, phi, and uh, momentum, and it, it uses message passing um, to create a graph that represents a jet like that, um, where the graph representation is is the, is pretty similar to that um, jet tagging representation that I showed previously. Um, and then the discriminator similarly uses message passing or graph convolutions um, to classify the graph as being real data or generated data. Um, and you can see in these initial results at the bottom um, using this um, open source JET data set, um, so not actual experimental data, but um, uh, very similar um, to detector data, they can recreate these key um, jet variables, eta phi and PT with really high fidelity um, compared to our normal physics driven simulations. So then getting into tracking, which is what I've been working on recently. Um, I So the way that we've kind of traditionally used uh, GNNs for tracking in um, LHC data is we form an initial graph from space points in the tracker subsystem. Um, and the graph can be formed in different ways, um, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. Um, like you can construct the edges algorithmically in different ways. Then we process the GNN through a combination of node convolution and edge convolutions to get probabilities on all of the edges. Um, that they are a, a true edge that actually comes from a track or they're a false edge that is just um, a, a relic of the graph construction. And then once you have um, assigned probability these edges, you would apply some kind of post-processing algorithm to link them together into the full tracks and extract the track parameters. Um, so that's what this top plot is showing. This is like a segment of, the detect of a detector. Um, and the red lines are all the um, edges formed by the initial graph construction. The blue edges are the true edges that you would want the graph to, uh, the GNN to learn to weight highly so that then you could reconstruct these particle trajectories. Um, and the work that I'm gonna show here that I've been doing uses this TrackML data set, which is an open experimental, uh, experimental agnostic experiment agnostic um, data set um, that is pretty close to the planned high luminosity LHC um, ATLAS detector um, design. Okay, so I think Jeremy covered this um, also, but edge classifiers um, typically combine node and edge convolutions on the graph um, to update, update the features of both. So, um, for the node embedding, you receive information from the connected nodes in the graph, and then that's processed through a feed-forward neural network um, to update the information of the target node. And the edge convolutions basically work the same way, but you're aggregating information from nearby edges rather than connected nodes. Um, and you can see an example of, of <clears throat> this kind of architecture. Um, at the bottom where a graph module um, is a combination of uh, a node convolution and edge convolution. So some of the initial work on this that Exatrack did um, showed really promising results. So they used, like I showed on the previous slide, uh, this encoder and decoder structure. Um, where the graph is first embedded um, before the uh, convolution operations occur. Um, and they used eight graph modules um, with shared weights across uh, the modules. 
Um, and you can see um, they already get pretty good classification or um, yeah, separation between the real and fake edges. Um, in fact, uh, they saw a 90, about a 96% edge classification efficiency. Um, so the number of true edges that uh, GNN is capturing over the number of possible true edges um, and a 95% track finding efficiency when they actually merge those true edges uh, to form track candidates. Um, more recently, we've been working with this interaction network architecture, um, which is, is quite similar, um, but it applies relational and object models and stages to infer abstract interactions and object dynamics. Um, and again, these relation and object models like these node and edge convolutions are fully connected neural networks. Um, but what's interesting about the interaction networks that we've tried is that they're often smaller than the um, graph convolution um, networks. So we have trained an interaction network architecture based on this um, original um, paper from uh, DeepMind um, that was used to model physical systems. Um, and see pretty similar um, edge classification efficiency um, to, the, to the GCN architecture, but with, again, a smaller network. Um, and then some work that's been done in Exatrack um, recently um, looked at improving graph efficiency by embedding the features um, before they're processed by the GNN. Um, so you embed the uh, graph in an n-dimensional space where hits from the same track are um, moved to be close to each other. Um, and then you can score um, basically embedding neighborhoods um, around different vertices to create um, seed um, seed to target doublets. So your graph is actually the nodes are formed of um, pairs of, of tracker hits rather than um, single tracker hits. So you're already giving the graph a lot of geometric, like you're get, basically it has less to learn um, because you've created all of these doublets before you're passing it to the um, graph convolution network. And they've found that um, this further improves the um, accuracy and track finding efficiency of the uh, graph module architecture. Um, so we, we have constructed these graphs in different ways. Perhaps I should have put this slide earlier in the talk, um, but like, like um, we saw with the embedding studies, uh, the way we actually construct the graphs can help the GNNs learn more effectively. Um, so the way that we have been mostly doing it so far for these tracking studies is with this layer pairs method, um, where we basically create all the possible edges um, in a graph between nodes and adjacent layers of the tracker within a certain delta phi, delta r range. Um, so this is, you know, a, quite algorithmically quite easy, but can also create a lot of false edges. Um, so it's definitely possible to further optimize it. Um, and there are some ways we've looked at that, like people have used um, K-nearest neighbors to form uh, the tracking graphs, um, but we've also been looking at things like um, doing well dynamic KNN where the graph is reformed at like each, each iteration of the graph network, um, a learned clustering, um, where you have a network dedicated to doing the graph construction um, before it's then passed to a GNN. Um, and then also um, things like um, doing some kind of um, physics driven transformation of the initial graph um, where clustering is easier. So an example of that is um, A to Phi space, um, which is shown in these um, plots down here. So this is a full event. Um, in the tracker in eta phi space. And if you zoom in, you can see that in this representation, um, individual tracks are um, close to each other and um, pretty well separated. So you can do a simple like density-based um, clustering method like db scan 
to form an initial graph where already you're um, reducing the number of, of false edges um, significantly. Um, some other things we've been looking at recently is doing data augmentation for the tracking studies. Um, so one thing is that um, a lot of these studies have just looked at the barrel of the detector um, because it, it can be, it, including the end caps adds a lot of complexity to the graph construction stage um, because it, it, it's dif more difficult um, with these like layer pair kind of graph construction methods we've been using um, to map what is adjacent layers and um, when you're transitioning from the end cap to the barrel. Um, so we worked on this with the innermost part of the uh, detector only where it's easier to do this mapping. And we found that um, actually including the end caps typically improves the edge classification efficiency. Um, basically, as we understand, because um, there are fewer false edges in the end caps than there are in the um, in the barrel. And um, we've also looked at dropping layers from the graph construction. Um, so trying to reduce the size of the graph by kind of intelligently um, reducing the graph size while maintaining enough information to do the full track finding. Um, and that's been preliminarily quite effective. Um, and then we've also looked at um, kind of uh, physics driven uh, data augmentation um, by applying Z and Phi reflections of the graphs um, to kind of break uh, detector symmetry. And we found that applying the, um, the um, Phi reflection um, enhanced the learning, but applying a Z reflection to the graphs actually kind of made it impossible for the GNN to learn um, edge classification effectively. Um, which I think we're still trying to understand. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about with tracking is um, the work that my grad student and I have been doing um, recently on using instant segmentation GNNs um, to do tracking. So instant segmentation is the computer vision task of trying to identify individual instances of an object in an image and informing a pixel mask of those. Um, so the way that this can be done with GNNs, and I've referenced the paper that we kind of started from um, down at the bottom here, is um, after doing a kind of standard message passing, um, the, no the state vectors of the nodes are used as input to different branches. Um, so in our case, we have three branches. Um, a classification branch that um, labels the node as signal or background, a localization branch that predicts a bounding box um, around each node, which is then merged um, to create uh, track cluster candidates, and then a tracking branch that um, takes those track cluster candidates and uh, tries to directly predict the track parameters. So this, allow this architecture allows you to do the full kind of track finding process um, in one um, architecture that you can train end to end all together. So in our study of this, which we'll be presenting at the NeurIPS Machine Learning uh, and the Physical Sciences Workshop next week, um, we used elliptical bounding boxes. Um, so we construct the graph um, using that DB scan and Ada Phi uh, space method that I talked about a few slides ago. Um, and you can see, you know, it's quite effective already at, at separating a lot of the tracks into individual subgraphs. So this is the truth event on the left um, and then how DB scan forms the graph. Um, so a lot of them are, are well separated already and then you get kind of these dense area clusters, um, which is really where the GNN is needed. Um, and this is an example of the truth um, the truth bounding boxes that we're trying to learn. Um, so this is an eta phi space again. So um, each of the individual tracks is bounded by an ellipse um, that we encode using five degrees of freedom. So you have the center of the ellipse and then the semi-major, um, semi-minor links and then the angle of rotation from the horizontal axis. Um, and so this uniquely defines an ellipse and you can then encode that um, ellipse uh, information with the individual vertices in the track cluster um, by um, using the the location of the um, 
of the individual hit. So this is the way we actually encode the ellipses um, for the localization branch to learn. Uh, and then a final like extension that we've been working on in this architecture is actually doing this in conformal space. So conformal transformations, um, which you can see here, um, map tracks, uh, helical tracks um, in the transverse plane to straight lines. Um, and then you can just do a linear fit and directly extract track parameters um, uh, the PT and the impact parameter um, from that linear fit. So we've been looking at running this instant segmentation GNN architecture that I just described um, in conformal space. Um, so we're still doing the elliptical um, bounding box fitting, um, which you can see here, they're really in conformal space, very, very thin ellipses that almost approximate lines. And initially, um, we tried to do line fitting um, directly rather than elliptical bounding boxes. Um, but the issue we ran into with that is that for some um, tracks, like um, in the center, you basically get infinite slope. Um, so it's very, it's very hard to um, normalize the um, the uh, linear fit parameters that you're trying to get the network to learn um, because the slope can vary from basically zero to infinity depending on where in the detector you are. So um, the elliptical bounding boxes approach allowed us to get around that um, because we have this theta um, this theta parameter for the rotation of the ellipse rather than trying to do slope fitting. Um, and so this is very preliminary work. Um, there's still a lot of things that need to be improved, but I think it's quite an interesting direction that we're um, working on. Um, and I can maybe skip through this slide. This is just some um, ongoing stuff that we're working on with the tracking studies, further optimizing the graph construction, um, further improving the existing architectures. We have some new ideas around incorporating timing information um, for the interaction network architecture, Huff transforms um, using graph kernels for instance segmentation um, and different things. And then also note we've been doing a lot of work um, looking at uh, accelerating the inference of these GNNs um, for tracking using um, FPGAs. So to wrap up, um, graphs, I think, are a really natural representation for particle detector data because um, you can leverage the geometric information really effectively. Um, I talked about, well, I don't know what happened to my link here with this 1919 thing, but um, I talked about uh, graph classification for jet tagging, um, high-level node features for particle object reconstruction, um, so, uh, GANs uh, with GNNs, and then I didn't have a slide about this, but um, and the link didn't work. But there's a um, some really interesting work, um, which is a bit different than GNNs, but is still using geometric deep learning on doing like optimal transport for kind of event level analysis um, with event graphs. And I'll I'll try to update my slides with the right link to that paper. Um, but I just wanted to point that out if anyone is interested in looking at that. And then obviously um, doing the edge convolution uh, classification architecture for um, tracking. Um, so I think this is a really, really exciting area of research. Um, geometric deep learning is really synergistic with the, the kind of data reconstruction tasks that we have in particle physics. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot more interesting stuff to be studied. Um, thank you. And I know we're over time, um, but yeah, if it, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are questions. Thank you very much, Savannah. Uh, I see Mike already has a stand up. So we'll start there. Yeah, so um, really nice talk, some very impressive work. I th think this is on page 10, where you, you talked about the original proof of principle from Exitrack X. Mm -hmm. and Oops, sorry, wrong. I want to go back two more pages, three more pages. This is terrible. I had everything marked up and I can't find what I wanted. Uh, at some point, you 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 reported a, a track efficiency. I guess it's um yeah, it is on page 10 uh, of 95%. Mm -hmm. 
presumably someone's taken the same data and running more traditional type tracking algorithm. Do you know what the efficiency would be for that type of algorithm? Um, I actually don't. Um, this is, yeah, this is something we've talked about needing to do. So we have comparison numbers with this specific track ML data set. Um, but I don't, we haven't done it yet. Um, I don't know if other folks in Exatrack who are maybe on the call have done that, like using a, a traditional Kalman filter approach on this data set. Yeah, it'd be really interesting. I mean, you know, if you're doing better, that's great. If you're not doing as well, then it'd be really interesting to look at the overlap. Mm -hmm. And then the obvious other question is, is this intrinsically faster than, than a traditional algorithm? Or is it for whatever reason, slower? Right, yeah, so that is kind of a main motivation for using this um, graph structure. I mean, in addition to the, it just, you know, kind of makes sense from a geometric perspective is that it should be faster um, than these kind of com com combinatorial um, approaches we have to tracking right now, um, because there are a lot of ways to like parallel parallelize the um, GNN inference once it's trained. And then also we're doing these studies on accelerating the algorithms um, with FPGAs, either as co-processors or um, as uh, running the full inference directly on FPGAs. So that, yeah, that's a main motivation is that hopefully these should be faster um, than traditional approaches. Yeah. So then I had one just minor technical question. So this is on page 14. So, so I'm looking at this loss as a function of epoch number. And I guess all those which are you know, clearly visible, the lower four, are all still decreasing. Mm -hmm. Is this the extent of your training or did you just keep going until you reached a real you know, obvious plateau with overtraining yeah. or something going on? Yeah, so for this particular plot, um, we actually cut off the training. Um, before it fully converged um, because we were just kind of interested in like the effects of the data augmentation in particular. And you can kind of see like, you get the behavior trends even though it hasn't fully converged. Um, so normally, yes, we do train for, for longer until we get full convergence. Um, we just didn't do it for this particular plot. I do have one more question. This goes back to the, 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 the original question, I guess, um, from the earlier page. What is the relationship between your cost function, your efficiency, and your false positive rate? I mean, they're, they're obviously related, but they're probably not the same. Um, but when you're, do, when you're training a GNN, you have to define a, a nice differentiable function for your cost, your loss, whatever you're calling it, mm -hmm. which is a single numerical value for each uh, event you're, you're processing. But actually, you have a multiplicity of metrics you care about. So you've called it efficiency and accuracy. I usually thought think of it as efficiency and false positive rate, but you know, those, mm -hmm. you can choose your pairs of variables there, right? But the point is that, that there's not a single metric that interests you. You're interested in a, a variety of metrics. But your cost function encodes a single number, right? Yeah, yeah. So we haven't, for the kind of standard edge classification architecture, we actually haven't explored different loss functions that much. Um, we've mainly been looking at graph construction methods as um, a way of tuning the uh, efficiency and accuracy or, or false positives um, because the number, like the fewer initial false edges you have in your graph, like necessarily the less 
false edges, it will be able to classify as true um, after being processed by the GNN. Um, so yeah, we haven't looked at, I guess, the relationship with the loss function um, that much for the edge convolution architecture. We have been doing it more for the um, like instant segmentation architecture, um, but that's also because it's like a much more complicated loss function. Um, so even getting it to converge in the first place has been challenging. Um, but that's definitely yeah, an interesting point that we could explore more. Okay, super interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a hand raised by Alex. Yeah, uh, for this where it says reduce size of graph while maintaining track finding efficiency, this uh, kind of made me curious about your consideration for pooling for the graphs. Yeah, um, we haven't looked at that yet. Um, it's, it's definitely something we can explore too. Um, we just kind of started with this pruning um, idea first. Um, I, w I was a little curious about the interaction graphs, just um, how they differ from message passing and whether or not, I, mean, I know you said that they're typically smaller than message passing, but are there other benefits that come from them? Um, so they're they're like extremely similar in the current application. Um, it's basically about where you do the aggregation um, of information from the neighbors. Um, they're traditionally used for like per physical prediction, or that's the the kind of use case that we started from. Um, so our eventual event, so they basically are used to generate like next time steps in physical systems um, based off dynamics. So you have the, um, for like each object or in this case hit, you have um, your, um, aggregating the information through a learned function um, through this relation model. Um, so you're, you're learning the effects of the neighboring objects on your object, and then you're aggregating it also through a learned function, which is the object model. Um, so traditionally, you know, in a GCN, you use something like just max or um, some other kind of fixed or, or not fixed, but like unlearnable, not, not learned um, aggregation function. And here the object model is doing the aggregation. Um, so it, it, it's a more adjustable function. Um, our eventual idea is to use timing information here. So to try to do track, pro, um, track finding through propagation, um, which is more in line with like what the interaction network was originally used for in like the papers we started from. Um, so trying to predict from like if you start with a, a small graph for the innermost layers of the tracker, um, then predicting the next steps of, of all of those hits and just looking for matching hits in the next layers. Um, but we haven't really gotten to that yet. Does this um, implicitly do some sort of instance segmentation or, I mean, is there a way to extract, I mean, if it's doing reasoning on objects, maybe I'm just misunderstanding. Yeah, so the objects are um, the individual nodes. Um, so I'm not sure there would you would have to add something to do instance segmentation, I think, because in instance segmentation, we're like looking for track track uh, candidate clusters. So a collection of nodes um, and, and here the object um, that you're doing like a learned aggregation for is an individual node. Um, so I don't think it's like directly related, um, but I'm, I'm not totally sure. Okay. Thanks. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, well then thank you to our speakers, uh, Jeremy and Savannah, you gave very informative talks. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.